Daystar is a fighter most people haven't even heard about. It is both a no-nonsense design while still having multiple surprising interwar features that make you just wonder. It provided a valiant fighting platform while saving a company from becoming a footnote in history. The Devotin de Vancis. Hello everybody and welcome back to Military Aviation History. I'm your host Bismarck and today we are having a look at the Devotin D-26 and D-27, an interwar fighter aircraft used by Switzerland. This aircraft is maintained here in flightworthy condition in Lausanne, Switzerland by Amper. Next to having some interesting stories attached to this aircraft, this fighter also proved important enough to save the Devotin company and allowed it to continue producing aircraft in the future, including the later D-520 fighter, the most advanced French fighter of World War II. Before we go into this aircraft's history, we need to sort out the nomenclature, so no one gets confused. Behind me is the D-26. This aircraft is nigh identical to the D-27, the fighter version, except for three main differences. First, it has no engine cowling. Second, it was given a less powerful engine. And third, it was used as a single-seat trainer aircraft. In interest of keeping things easy for this video, I'll just go on uh, talking about the 27, although pretty much all of it also translates to the D-26. The story of this bird starts in the mid-1920s. The French company uh, Devotin, named after the owner Emile Devotin, found itself thrust into some dire times. While its owner had acquired hands-on experience with aircraft production during the First World War, his own company, Devotin, was only established in 1920. It quickly became known for its parasol wing designs. While Devotin was definitely aiming to acquire military contracts, he also dabbled into the civilian market. What made his company special is that it had gone over to metal almost immediately, seeing it as the way forward, uh, rather than remain true to the tried and tested uh, formula of wooden skeletons and fabric coverings. True enough, this was a good call, as the wind was certainly blowing towards a future where metal alloys would reign supreme. The Toulouse-based company got to a rather good start with the D-1. Although France bought only a limited number of aircraft, Devotin had more luck on the export market. Available to order in 1922, the D-1 was a successful shooting star progressively improved and relabeled. In 1924, as the D9, Yugoslavia bought a whole range while Italy produced them under license and also Switzerland acquired two of these and a few more of the upgraded version as the years went by, helping Devotin establish his first contracts in this country. But Fortuna is a fickle muse and luck began to ebb away from Devotin. After the initial success, orders began to stagnate, and the new designs were not convincing enough. France did not give many opportunities itself, and Devotin was never really able to export his new designs. Come 1927, the money had run out, and the company was liquidated. This is where we turn to the D27. Luckily for Devotin, Switzerland actually showed an interest in a new design, which had just come off the drawing board. Emile himself had to move over to Thun in Switzerland, and here he worked with the Swiss Eidgenössische Konstruktionswerkstätten to further develop and design his aircraft until a first prototype was flown in 1928. Through this shift in fortunes, he was then also later able to move back to France and re-establish a company, the Société Aéronique Française. France itself still showed no interest in the D-27, but in 1930 he finally got what he wanted, a major order with the French military, 
with the D500 design. Ironically, it was actually the first meaningful design he had made that was not a parasol aircraft. In any case, uh, Switzerland kept itself firmly locked onto the D27, which was put into production in the closing months of 1929. One holdup had been the absence of engine production licenses, which had finally now been granted by Hispano Suiza. Switzerland now opened uh, their purse and re-equipped and reorganized their existing fighter squadrons, which were thus far uh, using a wild concoction and mix of World War I and interwar tech. The first production D-27 Freeze were delivered in 1930 with an official introduction in 1931. All in all, 20 pre-production aircraft were delivered, followed by 45 from the main production run, providing 65 aircraft in total, which was, for Switzerland, actually an excellent production run at the time, and it helped the Air Force to standardize their fighter squadrons. The main production run saw some improvements over the earlier orders. First up, the gear was actually redesigned with a better shock absorber and modern brakes. Throughout the, its service time, the aircraft also saw various modifications to it, uh, from radio communication being added over to night flying equipment, an auxiliary power supply, and an exhaust piping running via the outside of the aircraft. The D-27 was known for its good flying characteristics and ease of handling, with stories of their impromptu flying displays and wild acrobatic feats quickly echoing from one Swiss village to the other. The dimensions of the D-27 present a compact picture, with a length of 6.5 meters, a span of 10.3 meters and a height of 2.8 meters. Powered by the 12-cylinder liquid-cooled Hispano Zusa HS5712MB, it had 500 horsepower under the cowling. As you can see, this is where the main difference to the D-26 actually comes into play. More on that later. This allowed it to gain a top speed of about 300 kilometers an hour. Endurance was set at a maximum of 1 hour 45 minutes with a range of 425 kilometers. MTD aircraft weighed around 1 ton, going up to 1.4 tons for maximum takeoff weight. Armament was provided by two 7.5 mm machine guns firing synchronized through the propeller. 700 rounds were given. A provision for bombs was added, but it seems that this was a bit ad hoc rather than set in uh, standard doctrine. Turning over to the D-26 then, we are talking about a near identical aircraft. It is slightly longer than the D-27, about 20 centimeters, and it features an air-cooled engine. Uh, at the time, it was, this was either a nine-cylinder air-cooled Wright 9QA, uh, as in this example, running at about 250 horsepower, or the QC version running at 300. Obviously, there would be a corresponding performance loss, but not too much, as the aircraft was also around three to 400 kilos lighter. Uh, these aircraft then were ordered in parallel to the D-27s, uh, with production sitting at only 11 aircraft. This brings us to up to a grand total of 76 D-26s and D-27s combined. And to see one of these still in working condition is quite something. And it is only made possible because of the work of the now civilian owners. In fact, there is another one in flying condition in the world and having two out of 76 aircraft from the 1920s still flying is pretty damn good. Right before we head inside, let's have a closer look. As mentioned, the aircraft is of a parasol design, meaning its wing makes no direct contact with the fuselage, but is supported above it by two main and one supporting strut on each side. The fuselage is semi monoc with an all-metal covering, while the wings and the control surfaces, as well as the horizontal stabilizer, feature a fabric covering. The aircraft appears somewhat bulb up front before tapering off with a nice curvature towards the back. Up front we can see the distinct air-cooled engine as one of the main differences to the D27. And this engine of course is air and not liquid-cooled, otherwise you'd see a big jaw-like radiator hanging right there. The interwar period was of course a period of experimentation when it came to aircraft design. Designers were constantly trying new things, seeing whether they were feasible in a practical application. 
Now with the D26 and the D27, we have a neat little feature that you also see in some other aircraft, but is actually relatively rare. And that is a droppable main fuel tank. Now, as you can see, it is located right here and held in place with these straps, which are in turn held in place with pins. Should there be, for example, an engine fire, the pilot can simply say, oh my God, my plane's on fire, pull on a lever and the whole thing falls out as these pins are released. And there you go, you just saved your aircraft, you don't have to bail with a parachute and hopefully you'll find a nice little field to land in as well and all is well. So now let's jump inside. All right, finding ourselves in the cockpit, we are presented with a relatively snug fit, although it's not uncomfortable. There's ready access to all the controls and relatively easy legibility of the instruments. They are set in a sort of semi-circle here. Uh, starting on my left, we've got an altimeter. This one is in meters. Then we've got a clock, a variometer, the revolutions of the engine. We've got the speedometer. We've got a G unit a meter. We've got the altitude this time in feet. This is the uh, probably the, the one used in when flying it right now. Uh, we've got the fuel pressure. We've got the oil pressure and we've got the uh, cooling indicators for in and out of the oil temperature. The primer is just to the right of the altimeter. Uh, to my left, we have ready access, of course, to the throttle and the mixture, and the magnetos are just set below that. All the way on the left, a little bit further back, we've got the tail wheel lock. Below of that, we have the elevator trim, and a little bit below that, we have the brakes. Now, in the, uh, this aircraft, there is no differential braking, making it a little bit hard on the ground. Moving over to the right, of course, we have the stick then below that. The stick does feature a, uh, an old machine gun trigger. Uh, of course, the aircraft is disarmed, so this does absolutely nothing. Uh, the stick control is very close to the actual dashboard, and I've already hit my hand twice here. So it's probably operator error, but uh, it's something maybe to keep in mind when you're using this aircraft. And when you look all the way to the bottom, where the rudder pedals are, you also have your fuel tank indicator. To the right then you have a couple of uh, levers to do with the operation of the engine. For example, you have the clutch and then you have the oil cooler uh, radiator control there. Below that and very, very well hidden, so you don't use it accidentally, you have the uh, fuel tank release. Uh, I wonder how many tankers would like to have a button like that. In any case, what is also featured in this cockpit here all the way to the right, and I can pull it out if I get, there we go, is a starter crank. Um, this would be used obviously up front with the engine, and once the engine is nicely running, smoothly running, it would be given back to the pilot, who then stores it somehow back. There we go. And it's nicely stored. Up front, of course, you have your windshield, a little bit small for me, but it'll serve the purpose. Uh, we've got a telescopic cone side and we've got an auxiliary one just offset to the right. And above all that, we have a compass set in the wing. So yeah, that is essentially the cockpit of the D26 slash D27. The D26 and D27 might not be well-known aircraft, but they did provide Switzerland with a solid new fighter force while potentially saving the company, Devotin, from passing into the annals of history as a mere footnote. Staying in service then, of course, in Switzerland until 1948, they were relegated into supporting and trainer roles by 1940 when the Swiss Air Force re-equipped with new German B-109s and French MS. 406s. Thank you very much for watching and I want to thank Amper and especially Elliot for allowing us to get close with this flight worthy kite. If you enjoyed this episode please consider supporting us on Patreon or via PayPal because that allows us to push out this content on a regular basis. As always please also share this video and have a great day, good hunting and see you in the sky.